What's going on? Today's conversation is about black folks and reparations. A strange comment came up by someone who is jealous and I will explain the whole construct of jealousy. It was like, I get the vibe because you made some money that you don't think black folks deserve reparations. And I hit back, I get the vibe that you are jealous because I got money. Here's the thing, if you're not jealous, this doesn't even enter into your mind that he's got money. And he went on and on and on to explain how he wasn't jealous, how he had a house in the, I'm like, miss me with all that. Essentially, my position on reparations was formed when I was a child. Go back to the video, a curious child. And I read about reparations, I knew about it, and I just like, it, it didn't make any sense to me as a poor little black child in Alabama. It didn't make any sense to me. And there are many people that black folks are owed reparations. And let's go ahead and have the conversation. What would reparations look like? I'm gonna tell you a story of something I saw in the West End. There was a girl whose grandmother who owned her house free and clear, this grandmother died and left this young child $400,000. Within six months, that money was gone. And does reparations look like a cash check? What does reparations look like? Cause I always hear, you know, we need reparations. We need reparations. We need some money. They need to cut us a check. How much? To whom? And also, who's gonna get the reparations? That's gonna be a tricky issue right there because of interbreeding. You've got so many black folks, like with a man who is black, but married to a white woman, would he be eligible for reparations? Would a black woman married to an Asian dude, would she be eligible for reparations? Because see, if they're married and they get the reparations, that money enriches their family. So it's just not gonna stop with that person. There are so many questions, because I always hear this thing of, well, you know, I see a need for reparations because what happened so many years ago? And I think it's, an ex it's a pointless exercise. It's not gonna happen. It's just not gonna happen. Now, do I feel that the original slaves those people deserve reparations and they got screwed. They did not get their 40 acres in the mule. They were screwed. Now, those of us who, have, who are the descendants of those people, how have we been harmed to the point, because there, there's, there's a conversation that we deserve reparations to make up the wealth gap. And I don't care if, if it, if, if American, if black Americans would cut a check, let's say $500,000, you know where most of that money would end up? Gucci, Porsche dealerships. Um, it would be spent. I, I think 70, 80% 80, 80 of the people who would get that money would spend that money within a year and be right back to where they were, except they would have more creature comforts. Now, Let's go ahead and dive into the reparations conversation from an intellectual standpoint, not from a, we need reparations because black folks were harmed and we're behind. First of all, if we were to get to the point where we had reparations, everyone that received a reparations check would have to take a wealth building, wealth development class. You don't take this class, you don't pass it, you don't get your check. Because this whole notion that I'm just going to give you money and it's going to make up for all of these past grievances, to me, no amount of money will make up for the atrocities that happened in the past. There, you can't put a price tag on that. I mean, people were mutilated. Men were raped. They would call it buck busting. This is why in Jamaica, they, they don't like homosexuality in Jamaica because of the things that went down there in the islands and the things. So without financial literacy, even if reparations were on the table and a check was cut in 2021, it is not going to wholesale 
improve the lives of black people because, and this is the truth, right now, a lot of black folks are messing up the money they already have. This is one of the core tenets of savage finance. Optimize the money you already have and then make more. So if they're already messing up the money they have, what reason would they have not to mess up some new money? Most of America is financially literate. 75%, and let's go talk about this wealth cap. 75% of Americans, which include white people, which include Latinos, which include Asians, 75% of Americans cannot raise $2,000 in 30 days cash. 75% of Americans can't do that. What wealth gap? There is a wealth gap between the elite and the 1%. Yeah, there's a wealth gap there. But from the day-to-day -day average American, I, I, I implore you, there is no wealth gap. I've dated too many, get ready to be triggered, black women, hoteps, white women who had poor families. They had no generational wealth, they had no money. I've seen this over and over again. So what wealth gap are we talking about? And statistically, the household income is like, what? 5,960, that's two people working. What wealth gap? If this pandemic hasn't exposed, I mean, who are watching all of these stimulus check videos? It ain't just black folks, it's a lot of white folks. It's a lot of white people who are in need of that $1,200 stimulus check. So what wealth gap? And like, at the risk of sounding elitist, yes, I am wealthy. And I'm damn proud of it, and I work really hard to get here. So if you don't like it, if me saying that triggers you, a big F to you in your weak mental state. Because here's something else. In America, there are people who are better than other people. There are people who have better ideals. There are people who are in better shape. There are people who look better. There are people who are better than you. Deal with it. This whole notion that we're all the same, we're not all the same. There is a group, a progressive group of black folks who are fit and trim, making money, and they're not associating with the predominant narrative of what black is to be. There's this girl, Mary Jane Bottom. She has a YouTube channel and she travels the world alone. This is not a typical black woman. And we're starting to see more and more and more and more progressive black people doing bigger and better things and making their mark in the world. And see, here's the thing. The progressive black folks make the whole race look good. And it's the knuckleheads and it's the trap boys and it's the people who are in and out of jail that makes the race look bad. But who's celebrated and who's denigrated? The progressive blacks are overwhelmingly denigrated by the less progressive black contingency. I've spoke about this at length. So, you know, all of these little comments, like if you mention my wealth in the comments, you're jealous. You're jealous. Because there are so many ways to make an intellectual argument without even bringing it up. The fact that you get this vibe is like, yeah, you know what? Yeah, I'm cocky. Yeah, I'm arrogant. Yeah, I'm an elitist motherfucker. Because I have climbed up to this path. I have killed many dragons. Yeah, this is who I am. You don't like it? You don't have to watch. You can leave. Because if you get so triggered by the fact that I speak the truth that I speak, you are mentally weak. Well, you know, he's got money. And I saw a lot of that. Because if you don't know, I've re reactivated the first disruptive male, and I call it the dominant male. And I got a lot of that pushback over there by mentally weak men. And you know, I've got a whole new paragraph. I got a whole new um, process that I'm getting ready to do. That's going to be real different because YouTube is very much against that type of content very, very much against that type of content. YouTube will not promote the videos that have that type of content. 
And I just put up a video today where the girl had clothes on and they removed the thumbnail because it was just too sexy. So when I was doing that content, I had many men, because essentially the, the gist of this conversation is we should be working to build institutions, banks, communities, and schools. And you know, if you want to work on reparations in your spare time, fine. But in your main time, you should be working on things that will have a direct benefit to you and your family. That's what the point I'm talking, because this whole notion, we need preparations. We, it, you, you don't even put it off in, in, cause essentially the conversation is, I don't believe that we need reparations. And that, that conversation is full of hate, dissension, agitation, people leaving smart comments. Like you wouldn't tell the Jews to forget 9-11 to forget. Like if you're sitting at home and you feel that reparations are coming your way, you're going to be sitting and waiting a long time because it's not, it's not happening. And from an intellectual standpoint, if you look at who was harmed, because you know, people brought up what happened to the Japanese, the Japanese people who were interned in world war II, they, they put together a class action lawsuit and they sued the United States and that's how they got their money but they were directly harmed. They were directly impacted. Please put an intellectual comment of how black people in 2020 are directly impacted and deserves reparations. An intellectual conversation, not like a jealousy lace, cause oh, he got money. That's the only reason he's talking like that. None of that stuff, cause I'm just gonna delete that and block you. But if you can make a solid, intellectual argument why we in 2020 deserve reparations without the jealousy without the hate without the slick comments if you're capable of forming that kind of conversation we'll have that conversation because see one of the reasons because i have another channel called the mindset coach and your mindset is so important to your success and this is one of the reasons that I keep saying the things and people keep missing it because they don't understand that collectively, if you're sitting around thinking that we deserve reparations and there's this mental thing that happens, I don't even know how, what to call it. I don't even know if there's a word for it, but when you know there is a possibility for a certain thing to happen, that will prevent you from working as hard as you can to build the things you need to do. Like Forex day trading. Many people know that there are successful Forex traders. There are successful day traders. And the fact that they know that these people exist prevents them from doing the hard work they need to do to build their businesses. Cause it's like one day I'm going to, I'm going to figure it out. I'm going to find that magic jelly bean. I'm going to figure out the code. I'm going to, I'm going to find, figure out the game code. I'm going to be, you know, good. I'm going to be Gucci. I'm going to be Gucci. And this is one of the reasons that I have been consistent in talking about like, you know, this whole thing. Let's, let's say with reparations, what do you think black folks should do with the money if they got it? Because, you know, I have this, this intellectual exercise I play with myself. It's just an exercise because I don't play the lottery. If I played the lottery and won a hundred million dollars, I know exactly what I would do with it. I would take that hundred million, take all of it and buy income producing assets, every last penny of it. So that hundred million would not be a sunk cost of me getting a hundred million in spending. It would be invested into an asset that will create income and revenue after I'm dead. That's what I would do with it. Wouldn't even think twice about it. I wouldn't even have to hire an attorney or hide or do all this other stuff that some lot, cause they, they're so freaked out because they don't know what to do with the money. They're freaked out. They're, they're so freaked out that they do all this stuff. I would go claim my money the first day and then put it in the bank, then go out and put together a team of, uh, you know, professionals to help me buy this real estate and start buying. That's what I would do. And you know, I talked about Omni and the Hellcat, and this is a prime example of what happens. Cause I saw an interview where this 
His wealth came 2017. He lost it in 2019. So he was living large for about two, almost three years. And this is like, once again, I will tell you, if he was my client, I could have protected about 40, 40 million of that 50 million. There are so many things that could have been done. But once again, people appreciate the flex and the flash. And this is one of the most harmful aspects of black culture. You're going to get more attention driving the Lambo than you sitting down talking about solid financial advice. It is the audience that dictates that, you know, anyone that like, I'm not mad at Omni for buying Lambos and flexing like that because that's what get views. That's what the audience appreciates. This is what people watch. And you know, it, 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 it's, it's crazy how many people want to have this conversation about reparations, but this only goes like that deep. It doesn't go deep into it. It doesn't go into what reparations look like, who would get it, how much, what about a financial fitness test, a financial literacy test before you got the check to make sure that you had some guidance on what to do with that money. That, I've never heard that conversation with the reparations conversation. Never heard it. We need money. We need money. Yeah, we need that money. Cut us a check. And as a financial coach, and I'm going to talk about this yard bird. I know what you need to do with your money. I had someone who was disagreeing because on my video that you should pay cash for cars. Someone said I disagree. I like prefer the lease. And I just put in his comment a link to information that states that if you keep leasing and, and financing cars, you delay retirement 10 years or eliminate it. See, I'm not just saying this stuff off the top of my head. I'm not just pulling it out my butt. There is a reason that in, on this channel, early days, I was like, go out and get you a paid off car. Because I'm telling you, good financial habits lead to a good financial life. So I got this fool who's been watching me. He's like, oh, you start off with storage. He said, because you didn't go to college. You're not fit to teach people how to handle money. And, you know, I, and he was all on this financing and leasing cars. And this is the thirst, that new car smell. I have that new car smell in my new Porsche. It's lovely. I got I like mm, new car smell. Mm, I like it. I, I love it. I, I get it. But why are you going to put yourself in a position to have a depreciating asset that while you're still paying for it, you can be in a position where you owe more on that car than it's actually worth. That is financially bad math any way you look at it. And this is what many people find themselves into or something that's even worse. You roll over the negative equity into a new car loan. So you're driving one car, but you're paying for two. You are getting buried in that car. That's, that's just stupid. I should say, I shouldn't say stupid. I should say, this is part of American culture, the great American credit indoctrination. Cause people, I saw someone's like, you know, credit's better than cash. Anyone that tells you credit is better than cash. They've never had any cash. I'm gonna give you another illustration. There's a lot of these wholesalers who make really good money and they, they, they never actually compartmentalize their money to the point where they can get rentals. Like if you're doing the wholesaler, you should have 10 rentals. If you've been wholesaling for five or 10 years, you should have minimum of 10 to 15 rentals. You found these deals. You should have the rentals because this gives you monthly income because with wholesaling every month, you got to find new deals. Every month you start off at zero. Whereas if you had some rentals, you would have some residual income coming in every month, regardless of what you did with your wholesaling business. But I've seen it. I've seen the channels where, you know, there's guy, he was doing wholesaling. He's flipping. He talks about his hard money lender. See, if you were financially literate and you were making that kind of money, you would be in the position to be your own bank. After five to seven years of doing that, you should be in the position to be your own bank. You should be in the position to fund your own deals. And because of the great American credit indoctrination, I saw this video the other day, this guy was bragging about having 99 mortgages 
his cash, his positive cash flow, that, you know, because I think he was doing like $70,000 a month, but his positive cash flow was 17,000. So the bulk of that money went to obligations. And he's highly leveraged, very, very leveraged. And it's very interesting that during this pandemic, because you know things are starting to get back to normal, people are going back to work, unemployment's coming down. But this is the American way, because essentially I did some calculations. I can make more positive cash flow on six rentals than he's doing on 99. And I'm just sitting there like, what is, what, what is up with America not wanting to own anything? It, it's crazy, but I digress from the conversation. Let's have this chat about reparations. What does reparations look like? How much and who gets it? Because see, all these conversations about rep reparations, it's just we need to get it, but there's no texture, there's no outline. There's no deepness in the conversation. It's just like, we need to get some reparations. And you know, it, it, it's funny. It's just funny because for me, I will speak of myself only. I'm not sitting around waiting for reparations. I'm going out and securing the bag myself. I, Cause I don't ever see it happening. I don't ever see it happening from an intellectual standpoint. Not a, he got money so, you know, F everybody else, y'all. I got mine. You need to get yours. This is, you know, coming to the guy who used to give away 19 courses to black folks, and 90% of the black folks didn't even open up the courses. See, y'all taught me how I should govern myself. Cause see, at times I have these moments where I just want to give away and just give and give and give so much, and y'all taught me that that just ain't gonna work. If I don't make y'all respect the process, it ain't gonna happen. And that was the, you know, and a lot of people got those courses. They're the first people. Please take me off the email list. I am so tired of you trying to fix my financial life. I'm so tired of you trying to educate me. I'm so tired of you trying to teach me how to make money. I'm sick of it. I just wanna stay here with Big Booty Betty and drink Kool-Aid and watch anime all day. It's all I wanna do. I don't want to get better. I don't want to be, I want to deploy to do more principal. No, no, I'm fine where I'm at. Living in mediocrity. It is what it is. So go ahead, put those comments below. I'll be real interested for the intellectual comments. And if you mention anything about me having money, your comment's going to be deleted. Because see, you got to sit down and actually think from an intellectual standpoint about this, which a lot of people are incapable of doing because they get in their feelings. They like key key all up in their feelings and they can't have a civil conversation. And you know, it, it, it's wild what people are doing out there. It is crazy what is happening in the world, but let, yeah, let's have this reparations conversation. Let's, let's, let's go ahead and chop it up because who's gonna pay the money? Where's the money gonna come from? These are all important parts of the conversation. So do that and I'll see you guys in the next video.